Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! And I, like you, was beginning to wonder how the hell political satire was going to survive the current political climate, given that things are so crazy in reality and so unprecedented in terms of turmoil. I, I, I was genuinely concerned that those who make a living out of satirising politicians were going to struggle to make ends meet for a while. Thankfully, the, uh, the, the, the actor and writer David Schneider has stepped into the breach to restore the credibility of British political satire. I'll share that with you in a moment. I think we'll do it in this order today. Cameron? Corbyn, PMQs. So it's Cameron Corbyn both. That's how today's show is going to break down. Honestly, it takes me three hours to come up with these menus. Uh, seriously, working my fingers to the bone, burning the candle at both ends. Corbyn at ten. Cameron, no, Cameron at ten. I oh, see. That's why I have to do more homework. Cameron at ten. Corbyn at eleven, and then the pair of them at twelve. This is uh, the resignation statement that has just been issued from the office of the Prime Minister. The British people have spoken. I am confused as to why, after years of me blaming the EU and immigrants for everything, the electorate has decided to blame the EU and immigrants for everything. I was saddened that the Leave campaign stoked division and xenophobia during their campaign, as the stoking of division and xenophobia is my thing. Just look at the London mayor election, the Home Office vans I sent out, and so on. Hell, I even used the word swarm. I will now step down to spend more time with my offshore funds, but I'm proud of the legacy I leave behind. An NHS in turmoil, the rich having doubled their wealth, while the poor and vulnerable are driven to food banks, critical shortages in social care, schools, GP surgeries, etc. Houses that young people will never be able to afford, debt high than ever, etc., etc. I'm proud to have gambled away this country's future, its economic prosperity and its moral standing in the world, simply to remain in power. And I'm confident that I will leave you in the hands of a new Prime Minister who will be even worse. And thus writes the uh, comedian David Schneider today. I think rather wittily, but you may not like it. It doesn't really matter, does it? Because the point is, what is his legacy? What is David Cameron leaving behind? Five minutes after ten is the time. It's probably too early to ask this question, um, simply because we don't know what the EU referendum result is going to lead to, uh, what sort of country we may yet become. It could be that ten years down the line, we look back upon the last few weeks as being the birth of a wonderful new dawn and David Cameron will be responsible for that in some sense but of course he didn't want it so even the possibility of 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 a, a brave new dawn for Britain won't necessarily be part of David Cameron's legacy I just asked Nick on his way out of the studio because he's a couple of years older than me whether or not legacy has always been something that we talk about I don't think it is I don't think it is. I think it began with Blair. Didn't Blair actually articulate the word legacy when talking about himself? Which, it seems, sometimes is all he ever talks about these days. The, the notion that a prime minister... A legacy. What is a legacy in the sense of a, of a prime minister? It, it's the biggest things he's done, the biggest changes he or she has effected on a country. The, the biggest difference between Britain in 2009 and Britain in 2016. But I, I don't know that it's time for that contemplation yet. I'll, I'll throw open the phone lines now. Feel free to interrupt me and, and crack on straight away. What is the biggest difference between Britain in 2009 and Britain in 2016? And obviously I mean in terms of, of things that politics affects. I, I, I wouldn't know where to start. It feels like a meaner country, doesn't it? It feels like a country where some lids have been removed from pots of bile that many of us were too naive to realise had been bubbling quietly away in the background throughout all the years of it being frowned upon to be publicly racist or publicly bigoted. Hate crimes against the disabled have rocketed, I read today, which adds to the narrative the notion that somehow we've become a meaner, more inward-looking nation. But I don't know that David Cameron can shoulder the responsibility for that. Is there anything about Britain in 2016 that's better than Britain in 2009? We've come out of that global financial crisis, but I don't think even the most uh, committed Cameroon could claim that he'd played much of a part in that. We're more in debt, I think, as a nation today than we ever were. Um, prisons are pretty close to breaking point. Schools have never had lower morale than they currently have at the moment. The NHS had its highest ever patient approval ratings in 2009-2010. Let's just say that it doesn't today. 
Uh, I don't know what else you could point to. Equal marriage is, is, is a great thing, and yet most of the people who are deeply perturbed by it are on the same political fence as David Cameron, historically. So, I mean, he can claim the credit for that, and yet it would be his own cheerleaders who probably looked at it most askance. I didn't realise that my analysis was going to be that negative, actually. I, I, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth until I open it. I hadn't, I hadn't really thought it through. I was hoping you'd sort of pile in early on this one, but, but that's true, isn't it? We, we did have the highest patient approval rating on record in the NHS when he got the keys to 10 Downing Street. We did have uh, uh, relatively calm scenarios in classrooms. Uh, the morale of teachers, while not high, was higher than it is now. Prisons were not at breaking point and reporting incidents of self-harm and violence on a scale that has never been seen before. What, 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 what else do you care about? I mean, what else are the things that matter to us? Uh, like interest rates are low. And I, I, again, is that really anything to do with politicians or is that everything to do with the uh, ebb and flow of international economics? What, what, what's the biggest difference between Britain in 2016 and Britain in 2010? Hit the numbers now, you'll get through, I promise. 0345 6060 Because if we can't put some more flesh on these particular bones, then all this talk of legacy is absurd. He, he's left practically nothing behind. Nothing at all. It's a mark, isn't it, of just how much power the media wields now. That David Cameron has thus far been portrayed in relief to Ed Miliband and Jeremy Corbyn as some sort of messiah, some sort of saviour. The notion, I, I see it now in a couple of newspapers, I, obviously I'm talking about the Mail and the Sun. I'm in one of them today. I get described in the Daily Mail today as a former suit salesman, as if that's something I'm supposed to be ashamed of or embarrassed about. The fact that uh, before I... Before I fought my way into the media bubble, I worked in a shop. Yeah, I'm really embarrassed about that. It's a really, it's a really good insult. I worked in a shop. Yeah, cool. Um, but th these newspapers now are effectively blowing smoke up the nation's fundament to, to such an extent that you truly wonder whether George Orwell's 1984 was a work of fiction or a work of clairvoyance. That life is great. They are telling us life is wonderful. Everything's going up roses. Everything's marvelous. I wish I could believe that. It must be what. But nobody does, do they? All you got to do to find evidence of the contrary is look out of your window and what do you see when you look out of your window in terms of this country don't ring me up and tell me that you can see a washing line and, 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 and the bins have just been emptied what do you see when you look out nothing's changed at all for the better has it really do you know I don't even mean that as a criticism of David Cameron I really don't uh, I, I think he inherited a, a, a toughish brief although not as tough as it needed to be with reference to things like education and health what, what, what's changed? Do you know I'm reaching an age now where I think the best Prime Ministers are probably the ones that keep everything really steady and don't bring in too much change. I'm 44 years old and I think I'm achieving small c conservatism in the sense of uh, turmoil and stability. We'll get on to why instability and turmoil might be politically healthy in the second hour when we talk about Jeremy Corbyn. But today I want to talk, this hour I want to talk about David Cameron. I want you to tell me genuinely what you think has changed. If you were carving the tombstone of David Cameron's prime ministership, what would you put on it? You know, like where, where it says loving wife, mother and grandmother. What would it say for David Cameron? What would it actually say for him? And I, maybe I'm being a bit arrogant, but I think the reason why I'm worried that this might be going a bit early, I might be asking him a bit early, is I can't, I, I can't think of much to put on it myself. That, of course, doesn't mean that you can't. You can email james at lbc.co.uk, you can text me on 84850, or you can tweet at Mr. James O'B. I've got I don't think we need to overcomplicate the question any more than that. This is this is it. How has the country changed? What has David Cameron done to Britain? For good or for ill? Let's just make a list. Daniel's in West Hampstead. Daniel, you can you can have the first entry on our list. What's it gonna be? Thank you, James. Um first entry on the list is gonna be massive, unforgivable cuts to frontline public services under the guise of or the ideological guise of you know economic uh, necessity restoring the budget deficit and debt which have both grown what well, which ones would you point at first well and, and what do you have personal experience of well i talk as a former frontline police officer 10 years um 
with the Met. Yes. Um, and, and I saw personally, and it was one of the reasons that drove me to, to, to leave the job, huge cuts. The Met lost over £500 million from its budget. Um, and we saw that translated into clo the closure of police stations, the, um, the, the, the cuts to frontline response vehicles, the sapping of morale, the, the, the necessity of, um, of very experienced and, and dedicated police officers to, to, to leave the job. Um, it, it also affected the Do you know the problem justice. I have as a journalist? Well, is, 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 is there are some professions that always seem to be complaining. And, and I don't mean that as an insult, and I know that that, that, that is what, you know, agitation and, and lobbying is all about. But, but when you say coppers have had a really rough deal, when were, when were, when were they last happy? Well, I think... Um, and I really don't mean that as a... As a I, I mean, it usually lasts about three minutes, doesn't it, Daniel? When I start a show determined not to have any fights with anybody. Which, <laughs> 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 well, as a born police officer, I'm used to diffusing fights, so it's all right. <laughs> I should get you in the studio <laughs> for the next hour anyway. Well, when, were, when were coppers last happy? Well, I, well, uh, you know, you um, poten and potentially other people who are listening, other listeners may think I'm looking at this through through rose-tinted rose, rose -tinted glasses, but I think the, the police were happy. I was certainly very happy as a police officer in 2003, 2004, 2005, when um, we had um, Sir John Stevens was the commissioner. Um, the Met seemed a much better place. The policing generally, we had a lot more support, I felt. We had a lot more Fair resources. It's, it's, uh, not, it's not really helpful of me to point out that I could probably have found a, a, a spiritual Daniel in West Hampstead back then to moan about how good things were ten years previously. If it, we, we were seeing a managed decline. The thing I don't get, and um, there are some phone lines open, I should add, but this isn't going to be one of those hours where I give you a, 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 you know, a binary question and we all have a row. I just think we'll have a chat together today. The thing I don't get, Daniel, is that when we were talking about the fire service cuts and, and Boris Johnson was doing absolutely everything he could to avoid proper questioning on the issue, I couldn't quite get my head around why any politician would endanger themselves. Because, you know, my children live in London, but so do Boris Johnson's children. Why would he be deliberately endangering them by cutting fire service provision, as the FBU kept telling us he was doing? And the same with cops. Why would conservative politicians, why would David Cameron, in your view, have, have, have act actively tried to make the country less well policed, less safe? Well, the question I ask myself, James, honestly, yeah. the last few years, I, I felt so so betrayed. Um, I felt so betrayed because I remember, I don't know if you remember, um, during the 2010 election um, sort of period, David Cameron at one of the live events, he said, he talked, he gave a story, he talked about his grandmother who'd been burgled and he talked about wanting to increase um, sentences for burglars and you know, and then and then they just completely went r r roughshod over it and, and sort of went down the route of, you know, le less tough sentences and, and, and I, I agree, I don't understand why they did it. And, when, and the same thing with the NHS when they've sort of um, done this top-down reorganisation of the NHS when David Cameron's son, his late son Ivan, um, who was who was treated by the NHS, why would David Cameron and George Osborne have policies that sort of went against the NHS? They seem to be in constant battle. And the same with, with Boris Johnson and the fire station. Mm. I don't understand it. I genuinely don't know why. I would love to know an answer to that. But we'll, it, we'll it, try it, and get you one. Actually, I think I think it's a really pertinent question. Uh, the, the, the notion that if, if as a lot of people and Daniel is the first. Massive, unforgivable cuts is the top of our list of legacies. Um, it's, a, it's a very pertinent question. If it's true, if you buy into that analysis of, of, of the last six years of government, coalition and conservative, you have to somehow account for how people could have acted could, essentially against their own interest, how senior conservative politicians could have made their own city or their own country somehow less safe. 1016 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. 20 minutes after 10 is the time. I'm, I'm not putting anything on the list myself, but if nobody puts equal marriage on there uh, by 11 o'clock today, I will do that myself. The legacy, the list of legacies for David Cameron. Massive, unforgivable cuts from the former police officer Daniel in West Hampstead. Um, that has kicked us off nicely. Let us continue to collate contributions. Dave's in Watford. Dave, what have you got? Well, you know, I just sort of take issue with the last guy, really. I mean, it depends which uh, side of the fence you're sitting on, I suppose. Well, he was really. a policeman describing the police service. Yeah, well, I, you know, I think under David Cameron, you know, I think everybody's had to be a bit more accountable. And, uh, yeah. you know, How going you back... Well, um, he's basically lean to the beast. You know, there's not too much fat. And uh, I what think... What does that mean? Well, in terms of 
It cuts. I mean, let's go back 10 years ago when, in the good old days when, you know, it seemed to me, like under Blair and that, we were sort of heading towards a police state. You know, there seemed to be a bobby on every corner. You know, if you so much as put your hand in your pocket, you, you, you know, you could stand to be questioned. You know, the stop and search and all that kind of thing. And, you know, basically, they all look in. They haven't really got a So job. you welcome, you welcome the reduction in police numbers? Well, yeah, I think... Are, are, you, a, are you a burglar? I'm not, no. <laughs> so where, where do you go if someone robs your house? Well, basically... No, where uh, do you go? I just want to know. Wh where do I go? Yeah, who do you uh, call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> well, I'd probably sort of tackle them myself, hopefully, but I mean... So if someone know, burgles your house, you tackle them yourself? Well... You've never it, done that, have you, Dave? N no, but... No. Um, if someone I, punches I, you in the face tonight on the way home, who are you going to ring? Well, I'll, t I'll tell you this... Someone's selling answer, smack outside your children's school. Who are you going to call? If the answer you think is the police, forget it. Well, I, I'm waiting for your answer, Dave. What is your answer? But my answer? I, I, I don't know where to... You don't know who to call, you know. When you ring 999 and they say, which emergency service do you want, do you say none of them? I'm well, going to sort I, it out myself because there's too many firefighters, there's well, too many police officers, there's too many of those bloody nurses. Th no, this, this, So w what do you do when you ring 999 to report an emergency? Who are you hoping is going to come and help you? Well, it depends what it is, but, uh, you know... You well, I've given you three examples. There's someone selling smack outside your children's school, you've been punched in the face on the way home from work, well, or, or, or your house has okay. just been burgled. Well, Pick an example. OK, well, you do. You hope the police or the ambulance are going to come and help you. But you've rung me to tell me that you're glad they're reducing numbers. Well, I think there were too many, put it that way. I mean, OK, I Dave. You need, I, you know. I, I, I think you've delighted us for long enough. Joel's in Hendon. Joel, what would you like to say? Yeah, I... <laughs> Uh, the thing that occurs to me is I don't think any of these politicians actually come to power and want to make massive cuts, want to make people's lives miserable. I think... Well, how, do you give, how, do you, how do you give more money back to, uh, in terms of tax breaks without making cuts? Well, first of all, if the money's not there, if the money's not there, you, you, you've got to have a stable economy. I don't believe that any of these policies, on any side, I'm not talking about just Cameron, and I actually think Cameron has got a good heart and did want to do the right thing. They find themselves in circumstances where you know, they have got to try and make um, ends meet. Uh, in terms of legacy, in terms of legacy... Yes, in terms of legacy, because I'm not... I'm, I'm, cause I, I like your point, but the problem I have with it is how come the rich doubled their money and the poor got poorer? Well, yeah, I, I'm not sure on those statistics, to be honest with you. I, I don't believe... I mean, I, I certainly haven't seen that myself. But anyway, I mean, you know... Uh, in it, terms it, of is, legacy, it is just true. Okay. In, in terms of legacy... <laughs> but um, hey, carry on. <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of legacy, I, you know, it, I look at the youngsters, I'm in my mid-50s, I look at the youngsters nowadays, and I am delighted by what I see in, in the young generation coming up. I think they're sensible, um, uh, educated, in the main people. I think, I think social media's done a lot to encourage people. But these I aren't David Cameron's legacies. He didn't, he didn't invent well, social no, media. Think, and he's I only been in charge for six years. I'm not sure he's imprinted some sort of touchy-feely niceness, hugger-hoodie ideology upon an entire generation in the course of six years. What, what, in terms of his achievements, what are you putting on my list? No, so I, I actually think it is to do something to do with them. I think the, the whole discussion about equal rights for same-sex marriages, things like that, this is a huge sea change. And I think he is responsible for that, him and other people, you know, in, in government at the time. Well, look, I'm going to put equal marriage on the list. Of course I am. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, embellish it with stars and, and exploding fireworks and all sorts of things, because I, I, like you, think that it is just a, a, an unalloyed good. It's a wonderful thing. But, it, you know, it's only three or four days ago that the Conservative Party was in, it was, was being, the leadership was being contested by a woman who expressed herself upset and unhappy about equal marriage. So he might have changed the country, but it's a fairly diluted legacy if the most vocal opponents of it are still within his own party. Yeah, but you know, everyone's entitled to opinions, but I, think, I don't think it's just equal marriage. I think it's just looking at people differently, accepting people for what they oh, are. Mate, I, I, I that, need I need some of what you had for breakfast. You think the country today is more tolerant than it was in 2010? I think the younger generation are, for sure. Well, the young generation are always uh, more tolerant than the older generation. Yeah, I'm going to push yeah, you on this. I, I mean, where's the story I just pulled out of the paper this morning about, about the, the, the disability hate crimes going up by 
uh, uh, c- c- well, an appalling percentile. You know that hate crime since the since the referendum, racial hatred has become commonplace on public transport and British streets. Now, I, like you, hope the tide goes out again. The genie is put back in the bottle, the lid is replaced on all these buckets of bile, but you can't claim that Britain is a more tolerant, a warmer, friendlier place today than it was in 2010, can you? No, yes, I think I can. Okay. You look back at the 70s, I'm, I'm you putting it on the list. Okay, I don't want to look back at the yeah. 70s, I'm looking back at 2010, Joel. Yeah, okay, okay, but, uh, you know, I, I think half the problem is reporting. It's so easy to report things nowadays, and that's a good thing. And so I think so, a lot of these statistics are skewed by how easy it is to report, how easy it is to um, uh, get people uh, okay. to take action on, on issues like that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there's, say, disability, hate crime. I'm, I'm going to put equal marriage down, and, and, and I'm going to remember for future exchanges that you don't believe statistics. Is that fair? I, no, I believe reporting is a lot easier than it ever has been, and so statistics have been skewed. Okay. 27 minutes after 10 is the time. Paul is in Harrow. What are we putting on this list, Paul? We've got massive unforgivable cuts, we've got equal <laughs> yeah. marriage, and then we've got old Dave, who thinks we've got too many coppers. Where are you? Uh, dear mate, um, well, just to reflect on Daniel, really, from uh, West Hampstead, who is cool. Uh, he's absolutely right, ex-police myself in London. And, uh, the, you know, the, the, between them times, Daniel was saying 2003, 2005, six. And Sir John Stevens are about a nice place to work the police. Since uh, the Tories came in, they've done a lot of damage. They've done cuts to, uh, so bad that underperforming officers are going on to team without the proper training. The risk I'm going to say to you what I said to him. You know I am, don't you? Go on. Your lot have always got a moan on. No, it's just... Come on. If I, you phone me up back... Was I back here when John Stevens was in charge? I probably was. If you'd phone me up back then, you'd have been telling me about the good old days. Yeah, but uh, it's just a massive... <laughs> uh, all officers are, go- are going through. They've seen a massive change on how they're being treated in the last five or six years. Um, you've got all the cuts. You've got... Um, uh, just to add, you know, Theresa May's husband, I believe, is a massive shareholder in GOS, which I think is a conflict of interest with her if it goes down the road of privatisation in certain areas, and that's not being addressed whatsoever. Well, it uh, has I, been addressed. You just did. I mean, she's only she hasn't been she hasn't even started as prime minister yet. So uh, I know, I, I know, James, but I mean, I mean, she's done a lot of damage prior to her getting into the police with the cuts. What more damage is going to be done? And I think it's going to be scary times. Um, I know she has to run a tighter ship, the police accountability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that's fine, but you know. Is, is, you're never treading somebody's shoes until you've been there yourself. And if the police are saying they're shouting and pleading, look, what are you doing? What are you doing? How far is she going to go until it's too late? Yes. I, and so, I, again, I'm just ticking across what Daniel said for you. It is it is this it cuts to the police that you feel were unnecessary, uh, undermining of competence, even, you could add, and future fears of privatisation. I can't put that on the list because that's not a Cameron legacy. Right, I know, but as I said, well, it's under camera and obviously these things have happened as well, but uh, uh, I think, as I said, on the nicer side of her, so I'm not a big Theresa May fan, but on the nicer side, she's done a lot with terrorism and stuff like that, which are, um, and to protect the country, which is great. But, and uh, and yet, that would involve things like the Snoopers Charter, potentially, that some people feel very worried by. Yes. Yes, I know, but uh, I'm more, I'm more dedicated, my heart's gone towards... Uh, I'm not that, talking about so. Theresa May, Paul, I'm talking about David Cameron. Well, I know she is his legacy, actually. Let's put that on the list. Well done, actually. That's my mistake. <laughs> David Cameron's legacy is <laughs> Theresa May. Yes, correct. Uh, yes. Uh, but as I said, under, under Cameron, this has all happened. Uh, You're so a genius. It's, it's going to be scary times. That's scary all. times. Scary times. 29 minutes after 10, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I had a thought last night when I was at the circus. It was the first time in my sort of life that I, I'm now genuinely, hand on heart, hoping that I'm wrong about everything. So it's quite a nice sort of refreshing position to be in. It's half past ten. So there's a steward's inquiry already on Cameron's list of legacies. Uh, the equal marriage claim that the last caller but one put on the board has a few people have been in touch to point out that it was the Liberal Democrat MP, uh, Lynn Featherstone, who was responsible for pushing that towards the statute book. And as if by magic, Lynn Featherstone's just tweeted me to say, I know you don't like politicians phoning in. That's not true. I, I, everybody can phone in. I just don't book people. No one gets special invitations or special treatment treatments except under very special circumstances. Politicians and Premier League footballers are all welcome to her. Anyone can ring in. But I, but I know what you mean. I know you don't like politicians phoning in, James, but equal marriage was me, not Cameron. Read my book, Equal Ever After. So I'm going to have to put that in brackets, <laughs> equal marriage. I, I think, well, maybe we can all agree. I don't know. 
that uh, it would not have reached the statute book without David Cameron's support. But the idea that he started that ball rolling probably is a little unfair. So David Cameron's legacy is massive and unforgivable cuts. That's from an ex-copper. Uh, equal marriage, that's in brackets now because... Well, because Lynn Featherstone and Theresa May. That's probably the least controversial thing that's going to appear on this list. What is David Cameron's legacy? Uh, here you go. Quick look in the box of trolls. Tom's in Basingstoke. Cameron's legacy is he was a slimy, lying, EUSSR loving, anti democratic, traitorous fraud. So offering you a referendum on membership of the European Union probably did little to improve your mood, Tom. Poor fella. He can't win. Connor's in Bexley. Connor, what's going on the list? Um, the way Cameron's Tory government treated students, James. Go on. Um, well, we've had uh, our loans increased or trebled, and also recently the cutting of student grants as well, which, I mean, is especially ludicrous, given that Cameron likes to preach this idea of he's helping the poorest, the poorest children in society get well, the, well, I, 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 the poorest children in society can still get some financial support. It's just that you probably want to add the word very to that sentence, the very poorest. Previously, it was, it was there were more that got help. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you can talk about, yeah, the poorest children in society, but also then you're leaving out, you know, some a lot of working class kids, like a lot of, of course. kids I know, single parent families, where there is only one source of income, and even that in source of income is being rapidly diminished. Are you a student at the moment? I am a student at the moment, yes. So you you can't be your own case study then, because if oh, you're... no, not at all. No, no I, hang on, I haven't finished. I'm, I'm very lucky. I know, well, I can tell. You're on live on LBC, it doesn't get better than that, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> your day's peaked early. But the point I'm making is that the notion of accessibility is... is, is, is tough to prove because there are more and more people in higher education than ever before so to argue that he's compromised accessibility to it is tricky okay well I, that's a fair point i suppose but they might be coming out with lots and lots of debt that you'd rather you and they didn't have but the notion that it's putting people off is tough to prove possibly impossible it is tough to prove and i appreciate this is just one yeah. example of that but i've had a few friends that have, that have said why would i go to university and that you know incur twenty seven thousand pounds of debt when i could go and work say on you know in construction on my dad's scaffolding van which is brilliant and you know not everybody has to go to university but these are people I hear you. who i hear you tuition fees and 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 and, and cuts to grants that definitely can go on the list tuition fees of course waved through by nick clegg Yes, but then you're, you're kind of blaming the monkey rather than the organ grinder, then, aren't you, James? <laughs> 1037 is the time. David's in St. John's Wood. David, legacy, what have you got? Hi there, good morning. Uh, I think his legacy has been out of austerity. I mean, everyone's looking at it as a negative thing, but he's taken a massive decision and uh, managed to roll back the state. Uh, where? Made decisions which, where? Where has uh, he rolled back the state? I mean, the whole principle of austerity. He's, 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 he's well, well, you've already uh, said that. I want to know where he's rolled back the state. Where do you think the state well, is smaller? in terms of public cuts, he's reducing the public sector massively and allowing us to where? take our own fate in our own hands. No, but these are just slogans. I want, I want, I want, give me some evidence. What public sector cuts are you pleased well, to have well, seen? It's, it's something, you're, something you're talking about in terms of, I mean, he's making the NHS more efficient. And, uh, I mean, he has to take one step but, back. But so patient approval work. ratings are the lowest they've ever been. Uh, say again, sorry? Patient approval ratings in the NHS are the lowest they've ever been. The junior doctors, oh, the junior doctors are having a contract imposed upon them that they don't want, and industrial action has been enacted for the very first time in the history of the health service. Uh, How well, on earth I is that all good? He's making, we, we, he's making hard decisions, and it's short-term friction. I mean, it's, it's one step. Back David, it's not, David, 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 David. This is this is a radio phone-in show where yeah. I ask for evidence, and and if you keep saying things like hard decisions and short-term friction, and I keep saying give me some evidence, all, all that happens is that people listening think you haven't got any evidence so oh, no, the no, nhs no, doesn't no, work no 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 stop stop okay, talking the nhs doesn't work i just want you to tell me where the public sector has been reduced in a way that allows you to describe it as rolling back the state um well for example in policing they've made it more efficient they've closed down the local stations and they've got uh, they've, they've you know created are you a policeman where no, I'm not a policeman. Have you ever met a policeman who thinks David Cameron has been good for the police service? Well, you're not going to make everyone happy. We're talking about... No, 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 I'm not saying everyone. I'm asking for one. Uh, 
Uh, well, no, I mean, so no, where do yeah, you no. get the idea that the police service has benefited from the process you've just described? Serious, serious question. Where did you get that idea? Well, I'm, I'm talking about the society as a whole. I mean, the no, you're not. You're talking yeah, about police stations society. being shut. So tell me where you got the idea that that was good for who told you that was good. Oh, and my personal opinion. That's yeah, what it is. But, but where did your opinion come yeah. from? What's it based on? Well, I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. to know how thinking that. Police stations being closed is good for society. We, we take for granted everywhere that London is, uh, or England as, 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 a, as a country and a global, and London specifically being the number one global finance hub. You're, do, you're doing it again. I'm asking about police stations, and you're going off on a mad tangent. Just tell me what rationale you employ to conclude that closing police stations is good for our country. But, but you're looking at it black and white. We're off not, again. I'm, I'm using your own example, David. It, no, but he's making it more efficient. He's not. I mean, How is it more efficient? Because in terms of operation costs, uh, economies of scale, he's he's minimising the smaller ones and, and, and improving. But, the David, you're just chuntering. Uh, I'm just what? Sorry. Chuntering. No, These phrases like economies of scale and short-term friction—they're they're completely meaningless. It's, it's not meaningless. In the, it, well, that's why I'm asking you to provide some meaning. So explain to me how it's good for me to have police stations closing. Uh, in terms of, well, it, 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 it's not just, it, it's the means of, it's the whole budget, isn't it? It's not just... Pardon? For police stations. It's the whole budget, the whole budget. isn't it? Yeah, for, for the whole, for the death. I need you to unpack that for me, David. So the question was, how is closing police stations good for our country? And your answer is, it's the whole budget, isn't it? Could you just elaborate a little? The efficiency of the budget. The efficiency of the budget. Rolling back costs. Rolling back rolling costs. So it's, costs. this is your answer to why it's good to close police stations. I want to be sure that I'm yeah. properly, properly representing you. Yeah. It's the efficiency of the entire budget rolling back costs. Right. It's, it's, I mean, when you're talking about rolling back costs, making a more efficient uh, public sector. But now, now you're just saying the same meaningless words in a slightly different order. But it's not, it's not meaningless, though, is it? Well, I'm then show me where the meaning is. How is closing police stations good for people? It's, it, what is the principle of austerity, isn't it? Austerity, the principle of what? Legacy. Austerity. You're, you're talking... But we're worse talking off now, now than we were six years ago. Are we? We've got, we've got more debt. Okay, well... We did you not know that? Well, no, but what's about... No, no, no. Did you, did you not know that? No, I didn't know that. Oh, my what God. Are... Ten, no, sorry, you're disqualified. 10.42. Alex is in Bournemouth. Alex, what would you like to say? Hi, uh, I think uh, Cameron's... Well, it's, it's worth hang on, hang on. Just he... let's let, let's just let's give ourselves a moment oh, to hi, how are you? Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, Alex. Let's just you know chew the fat, shake hands, and take a moment to absorb the sure. absolute mind-numbing idiocy of the last caller. Can I can I say, James? I I really love your show, and I, I you know I think you're uh, socially liberal, and you know I, I like you as a person. Uh, but sometimes what? you are a little bit conceited with the people who come on. I can't believe uh, my ears sometimes. You you do to, I, I can't know, believe my ears. Foolish people. Uh, how, how can you? How can you be claiming austerity was good for the country without knowing that debt's gone up? Me? No, anyone. Oh uh, no, you're absolutely right. I'm actually looking at a study from the Tax Research UK, which found that the Conservatives are the biggest borrowers over the last seventy years. Every single Conservative government borrow more money and pay off less of the national debt than Labour. And my point, well, I, I didn't get to it, but the initial point was uh, that he's basically tricked the entire nation. I, I don't know whether this is, this is probably way before Cameron, but um, he's convinced people that Labour go on wild spending sprees and the Tories have to come in to rein in the bill strings. This is what this whole... I think Sajid Javid's latest idea is, 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 is another massive tranche. Actually, to be fair, borrowing now is quite a good idea because it's so cheap to borrow. Interest rates are so low. Give me something positive. Well, it doesn't have to be positive. We're trying to put a list of legacies together. A list of legacies? What, what, what are you putting on the list? Um... I didn't think of anything positive. <laughs> um... Oh, come on. Honestly, I really can't think of anything positive that he's done. And I follow policy, I read politics every single day of my life, and I'm, I'm not being hyperbolic, I literally do everything, and I can't think of anything positive, I'm sure there are. Well, equal marriage. Uh, I mean, the gay equal, yeah, obviously equal marriage, but, you know, that's already been said. Um, there must be something else. Uh, genuinely can't think of anything. Is it, but every newspaper in the country has been, been cheerleading for him for the best part of half a decade, and we can't between, we must be able to, I mean, obviously you could ring up and say austerity and then fall apart like a cheap suit when I ask you to explain what you mean. But in terms of reading the papers, there must be more than just equal marriage that we can chalk up to his premiership. Uh, well, um, 
Not really. I mean, to, to be honest, uh, Cameron, it wasn't really about him. It was more about his cabinet. So Osborne was... Adoption. You know, the Michael Gove on adoption is strong. I can't believe I'm the one having to fill in these gaps. Um, but does Cameron well, you know, Clay, is that Cameron's legacy? 50,000 people, uh, and it was all a bit of a sham. She deported all those um, immigrant students or whatever. Um, Cameron's kind of like the face of the party. So I guess he's kind of tried to turn the Tories into you know, centrist party rather than well, the more exactly, right wing that hasn't exactly be. worked out for him, has it? Well, no. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cautiously put Gove's adoption stuff down because it means a lot to me, but of course Cameron sacked Gove from that job. So, no, I'm going to have to cross that one out again. Alex, thank you, and thank you for the, for the ego management advice as well. I will take that on board, I promise you. Uh, it's 10.45, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I'm glad it doesn't happen very often uh, that we replace Prime Ministers because this search for David Cameron's legacy is proving pretty flipping difficult. I'm going to include Lee, who's tweeted at Mr James O'B to say the Bloody Sunday apology figures large in Cameron's legacy for the people of Northern Ireland. Well, I have to sort of politely point out, I guess, Lee, that not for all the people of Northern Ireland necessarily, but I, I, I certainly subscribe to your school of thought, so we'll put that on the list. I don't know whether or not it, it, it qualifies as proper legacy simply because I think whoever was Prime Minister at the time that the inquiry was completed would probably have felt compelled to describe it as David Cameron did as off the top of my head, unjustified and unjustifiable, I think. But no, it's, it's, it's certainly something that m made the world seem a better place. Simon's in Brixton to continue the legacy list. Simon, what are you going to put on it? Oh, hi, James. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I like David Cameron, and he actually had quite a green legacy. We're now the sixth largest producer of renewable energy from wind. We have 600,000 houses with solar panels on. Haven't they just, haven't they just axed a bunch of stuff for, for, for solar and wind power? They have, but after doing a lot, I mean, at the end of the day, it's nearly 1% of homes that are getting this renewable energy subsidy for having solar panels. I mean, how, how far do you go before you're basically paying everyone's energy bill in the entire <laughs> country? I mean, they've cut them, but the subsidy is still there, so it's still financially viable from a financial perspective to get solar panels on your home. Cool. And that's a really good thing, and they're building HS2. That's going to displace lots of flights from London to Manchester, London to Scotland. It's a nice green bit of infrastructure. Was that him wasn't that was that in place before he started or was that well it was kind of him and the liberal democrats was it it was it was post 2010 hs2 as i understand it yeah i'm gonna yeah, do I you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna consult my uh in <laughs> office uh i'm gonna consult my in office it's called google i don't know if you've met <laughs> i just want to find I've a year it. on it uh, yeah. i think they're, they're going to be big google i've heard about this little start off yeah, yeah. seriously <laughs> keep an keep an eye on them mate seriously they're gonna make yeah. i got i got 2009 yeah, just off the... No, hang on, shush, I've got to find it. High speed, where are we? High speed 2, January 2009, the Labour government established High Speed 2 Limited, chaired by Sir David Rowland, so you can't have that, mate, sorry. Oh, uh, OK, well, maybe I've stand corrected, but he, he could have dropped it. What do you mean, it. maybe? Well, he, he could have dropped it. Could you, could your have legacy is not made up of the things you inherited and didn't drop. Well, Boris Johnson got away with it. Boris it Johnson got away with everything. You can't use him as an example. <laughs> That's absolutely outrageous. He's got a love child running around Chelsea, and he was pretty close to leading the, the, the party of family values. So, uh, I, great, uh, renewable great energy. Thing. And what else? Um, he's, he's stopped the, the, corporate, uh, the corporate propaganda of Heathrow Airport. No, he hasn't. Stopped that being built. Oh, he has. No, he, he hasn't. Has. He could have let them go ahead and build it. He just kept postponing it because Zach Goldsmith was running for London Mayor and if, if he'd come out and said we're building a third runway at Heathrow, Zach was going to resign as an MP and it would have been an absolute cluster mess, as well, the kids don't stopped, say. He could have stopped Zach Goldsmith running for... A no, 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 you're peddling, no, you're treading water now. I'm, I'm sticking with renewable energy, although I'm pretty sure that a lot of environmentalists feel that he's gone into reverse on that in the last couple of years. Well, it, it seems like that on paper in the next... <laughs> I, mean, I love you, son. It seems like that on paper. It seems <laughs> like that on paper. That's where reality usually resides, on paper. Well, I mean, they've subsidised a lot of solar panels, now they've taken away that. It's a bit like giving someone a load of money and then not giving them any money anymore after giving them... Yeah, them. no, I like that. I, OK, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm not putting renewable energy, I'm just putting solar panels. Lots, okay, I mean, lots so throw, of... Hang on, I'm trying to write, I can't do two things at the same time. <laughs> lots of solar panels. Bloody Sunday apology. And the, Theresa May. 
and we're the sixth largest producer of, of wind energy as well. And Heathrow expansion is important because... Are we really the sixth largest producer of wind energy? Yeah, I saw a talk by a guy from Jujo Solar last night, and uh, and that's what he said, and I googled it just before I came on air on Wikipedia. <laughs> Christ, this yeah, Google business, I tell you, this Google <laughs> business is going to change the world, isn't it? All right, well, I'll take your word for it. I, I'll give you that. Uh, wind and solar. Of course, there'll be plenty of people listening who don't consider that to be an achievement at all, but such is life. Thank you, Simon. From Simon to Susan. Susan's in Dover. Susan, what's going on this list? I have to dispute what your earlier caller just said. Really? Even more than I did? Um, He said it was the greediest government ever, um, Cameron said he would, but just as it was taking off, he stopped the subsidy, so he's just cut it right back as to what it should have been. And aren't we now due to miss our 2020 targets uh, for the first time ever? Yeah, we're going to miss For renewable energy? Yeah, we're going to miss it all. He stopped it as it was taking off. So I dispute that. But what I was phoning to say was that people in general seem tireder and unhappier. Whoever I meet and they're sighing more, they're not saying good morning. As you walk along, you usually say good morning or hello to people, don't you? Yeah, well, I try to. People are, yeah, people are now just fixed in themselves. I've gone the other way, Susan. I, since we, I don't know how much you were listening to when we, we, we did the immediate reaction to the referendum result in terms of the people feeling emboldened to to tell others to go home and to be sort of outwardly racist. I've now gone the other way and I'm, I'm going to get myself into bother. I'm now grinning at everybody and smiling yeah. at everybody in the hope yeah, that, in the hope that if someone's been horrible to that person 10 minutes ago, yeah. getting a big smile off someone else might just sort of put a bit well, of spring back I in I always step. say good morning and smile at people and it's really... It's really gone downhill. I, I don't know if I can put this on the list of, of Cameron's legacy. Right, but Susan then. doesn't see as many <laughs> smiles as she did before. Can I? I don't know. I, I, I'm tempted to. General misery. I, yeah. Nazarene's in Southgate. Nazarene, what would you like to say? I'd like to say that um, because of David Cameron, a lot of teaching assistants have lost their jobs. Kids are not getting the help that they needed. Um, my school got rid of 20 teaching assistants, became an academy, and teachers are walking out by the droves. So for education, you know, that's going to be the, his part of his legacy. I know Michael Gove kept on saying how wonderful, but it isn't wonderful on the ground. And the fees tripling, that harmed my pocket, our pockets as well, because um, we've got one going to, u- gone to uni when it tripled, and we paid for the others, so we paid for him. Our money's completely gone, and being Muslim, we don't take interest. So we had to pay the fees, so I'm just saying education is down the pan. Okay. I, I, this isn't really going the way I hoped. Yeah, well, you might have hoped otherwise, but I was one of Thatcher's children, so... I, I don't like the policies of the Tory party, but this is just, you know, all the teaching assistants, he had a disabled child. Yes. And people said, oh, Mr. Cameron's going to be different. He's got a dis- disabled child. But the Tory policy, I told my colleagues, is to get rid of teaching assistants. We're just a mum's army, but we might be a qualified mum's army. They're not, and I mean, there are, still, there are still teaching assistants in, in work. There are, but tell me how one school can get rid of 20 of them at once. Well, because they've had their money cut. cut. Yes, Yes, the the money cut, but they can pay for senior leadership. No, I'm not arguing with you. I was just sort of hoping to put a slightly more rose-tinted gloss on this legacy list. I was going to send it around to Downing Street. Uh, I can't can't now. It's just full of abuse. Yeah, but it's not... Equal marriage wasn't even his idea. It was Lynn Featherstone's. (laughs) Yeah, it it, it doesn't... Bloody Sunday apology. the The papers glorify certain people and I'm sorry I'm one of the ones that I I, papers glorify Nazarene I don't need to teach you this the papers glorify whoever the owner thinks will be better for them that's all that's Britain James is in Gloucester James this is a pretty rubbish list mate I'm hoping you can flesh it out a bit a tough crowd this morning for you right yeah very (laughs) tough crowd what are we going to put on this list it's 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 uh, two points the first one's a very quick one which is the Hillsborough inquiry I think he handled that very, very well, and it was something kind of unprecedented in the country, and I think he did well in terms of that. Did he he didn't the, call it, though, did he? He didn't, I think... Oh, you can't, you can't have that. It's the same as the HS2. He just inherited it. The, the second point is, I, I don't profess to know the greatest deal about politics. My, my experience has pretty That's much come from listening to LBC. Good call. Um, 
since the, <laughs> since the referendum. Oh God, nurse. I was in my car nurse. at 7 o'clock in the morning that day, um, and, and I listened to you guys and, and sort of tried to build up some knowledge. And, and I think I think for the first time in, in memory, even as a 28-year-old, I mean, yeah, he's given the country an unprecedented amount of choice in terms of the referendums that he's called, but he's actually, for the for the first time, it, I can remember, oh. the UK don't actually have a credible leader to choose from. It, 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 there's, there's just, there's nobody, there's no shining light, there's no... I thought you were going to be television. putting some positivity on the table, James. No, well, that's why I said the Hillsborough thing first. Yeah, but um, you can't have that, because that wasn't him. It's, it's, it's pretty much all I've got, but in terms of a oh, legacy, mate. in terms of... Being you what really you let me down, James. For, you really let me down. In, in terms of what you can remember him for, it's it's just kind of throwing politics into complete and utter disarray. I'm glad he's gone. I so, the, is, I, 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 the producer told me you were going to be positive. I don't know whether you changed your mind when you were listening to the previous callers. Legacy, David Cameron's legacy is abject turmoil. And, and you know, the post-referendum stuff has gone even madder now. With, 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 I think British Aerospace or one of those companies has revealed they're not going to leave the country, and that apparently is a cause for celebration. So the idea was the country would get better, and yet within a fortnight of that result coming in, they're already celebrating that things, if we're lucky, might stay exactly the same as they were before. Yes, crack open the champagne. What are we celebrating, Mum? Absolutely um, identical circumstances to the ones we had before, fingers crossed, hopefully.